hello everyone. Um, what would you do if you're trying to answer a question for almost a decade and you're not going anywhere? How can you break this cycle and introduce new paradigms and new ideas into your field? So as a neurosurgeon uh, and a neuroscientist, I was always fascinated by brain aneurysms. And for those who don't know, brain aneurysms are kind of a weakness in the wall of the arteries of the brain, and it grows out like a balloon until it reaches a critical size, and then it ruptures and causes brain hemorrhage. And when that happens, there is a 50% chance of death from that brain hemorrhage. And those who survive, more often than, more often than not, they will have long-term sequelae from it. So it's a very bad thing. We know how actually to treat brain aneurysms. We know how to screen for them and treat them early as unruptured aneurysms. But we are faced by a very important dilemma, that most of these aneurysms don't actually rupture. And treating them as unruptured aneurysms, we are exposing patients to potentially hazardous treatment, potential risk. And that's unjustified, given the, that they will not have any consequences throughout their lives. So I was interested with a very important question. Why do some aneurysms rupture and some do not? So if we can answer this question, we will be able to focus our medical treatment, our resources, onto those subset of patients that are high risk, and then the risk will be justified. And to answer this question, we turn to the field of vascular hemodynamics. So since the 1970s, scientists learned that the endothelial cells, which are the little cells that line all the vessels in our body, respond to blood flow. In particular, they respond to the physics of the blood flow. So if you understand this physics, we will understand a lot about vascular diseases. And to do that, we borrow tools from the field of fluid dynamics. Fluid dynamics is the same field that studies the aerodynamics around a sports car or a jet plane to make them faster. It's the same field that studies the motion of the cloud or the oceanic currents. So we use the same tools, techniques, equations, and even software to model the blood flow in the arteries and, of course, in the aneurysm to try to understand their physics. And that helps us a lot to understand ab about vascular diseases and about lots of pathologies. But we still cannot answer that question in full. There are lots of gaps. We have some information, but we cannot really use it to make a prediction in patient and risk the patient's life. And that's where my research team comes to the story. So for the past few years, I've been working with uh, two brilliant individuals. Uh, the first is Dr. Simon Toupin. He's a biomedical engineer, laser measurement expert. He's uh, a genius with computer data analysis. He's the one on the right, the big guy. Uh, the little guy has more important things. And he's actually sitting here, so you can clap for him. He's a very important part of the team. <laughs> the second uh, researcher is Dr. Khaled Sokr. He's actually my friend before coming to Japan. He's a fluid dynamicist, a theoretical fluid dynamicist. He worked on things like combustion engines and jet engines for his PhD. So these two actually did not think that they will be doing aneurysm research when, a few years back. So in a way, they are kind of outsiders to the field with fresh idea and fresh take on the subjects that we are trying to tackle. So we combined our skills, biology, biomedical engineering, and theoretical fluid dynamics, and tried to answer this question. So, but instead of working like everyone was, we decided to work differently. So we started by reviewing old literature to see the root causes of the problem. We worked on mathematical analysis for basic equation used in our field. We even borrowed physics from oceanology and astronomy and applied it to aneurysms to try to understand more. What we actually found was something that we didn't expect to find, something that we're still amazed by till now. So let me explain in layman's terms. So we expect the human body in its physiologic healthy state to be in a state of order, right? So that order in fluid dynamics is called laminar flow. And when this order happens, we get diseases. So in, in, in fluid dynamics, that disorder is called turbulent flow. And that's the classical view of vascular hemodynamics. Laminar flow becoming turbulent, or, tur or order becoming disorder, leading to diseases such as atherosclerosis or brain aneurysms and others. What we actually found that the blood flow is in a perpetual state of chaos or turbulence. And it's happening in all our vessels all the time. So that classical view of order going to disorder doesn't really stand. And this is paradigm shifting in the field of vascular hemodynamics. We have to rethink lots of things and lots of pathologies and lots of diseases. Moreover, and more fascinating, we found out that the physics of the blood in the aneurysms are a very peculiar type of turbulence, a type of turbulence that were only reported in nature twice, in the North Atlantic Ocean Current and in Jupiter's atmosphere. 
And we had to check that for a million times because we really couldn't believe it. And you can ask him, he's, he's right here. He was the one who got it. So <laughs> of course, there are more data and there are more technicalities that we can talk about. And we are now doing clinical work and these findings are under peer review. But I'm actually more interested today to discuss my journey and as a team to get these results. Because I believe that if I have worked by myself for decades, I wouldn't have reached these findings. And working with these brilliant individuals who are from a complete scientific background than mine was a very interesting learning experience for me. A, a, a journey that I learned a lot about scientific research and working as a team. And through this journey, I formulated a kind of a rule, set rules for myself that can help improve any kind of collaborative work in science. And it really helped me a lot, not only in this project, but in other, in other projects. So I would like to share with you uh, my golden rule for successful teamwork in science, because I believe they might be helpful for other researchers, especially for young researchers starting their career. So here we go. The first one, don't be selfish. We all want to be the star researchers, right? We all want to get the next Nobel Prize, discover the next life-changing, no, uh, sorry, the life-changing medicine, or the next life-changing technology. And that's good, because that should be the attitude of everyone with career ambition. But in teamwork, we should, there should be a balance between selflessness and self-interest. Every individual in the team should know that they can reach their goal as individuals. At the same time, the team can reach its target as a collective. And that balance is very important, so everyone in the team is satisfied and gives their 100%. And that leads us to the second rule. Define everyone's role before starting the work. This role is a little bit underestimated sometimes, but I really feel that it's what makes or breaks a research team. We, before we started, we had lots of discussion, all of us together, about our shared roles and who would be responsible for what, who would write which part of which paper, who would be responsible for which part of the research, who, how we would arrange our names on the paper, which is a very important thing in academia and lead to lots of conflicts. So this made our work go seamless through different phases. And even though we have to rediscuss and redefine our roles because research is evolving field, we have to evolve with our research. But having this framework set from the beginning made everything easier by now. The third rule is consider different ideas even if you do not agree with them. So as I said, uh, my research team and I, we all come from very different backgrounds. And that leads to some interesting situation. Whenever one of us has an idea or a conjecture related to the other party's field, so I've heard some ideas from my colleagues that were not very scientifically sound on biology, but I'm not going to make fun of them because I had a lot of these on physics. And let's leave it at there. So <laughs> the point is that's not bad, because even the most absurd ideas can lead to some great revelations. I cannot count how many times one of us had an outlandish, bizarre idea, and then we started discussing it. And through this discussion, we, we ended up with a great idea that we wouldn't have otherwise had. So my advice when you work in a such a diverse team, if you, if you hear someone having an idea that you don't really agree with, just discuss it. See how that chain of thought, where it will lead you. You never know. The fourth rule, people make mistakes, make it a learning experience. One of the things that I really hate in, when working in a team is that one person who always makes a big deal out of everything, right? We all hate this person. So, <laughs> We all make mistakes, not because we like to make mistakes, but because we're human and we are bound to make mistakes. And we actually learn better from our mistakes, right? So my advice is when someone in your team makes a mistake, don't exaggerate it, don't make it a big deal, don't use it as a leverage, which I have seen some people do. Just discuss it, learn from it, and move on. Unless, of course, it's a gross scientific misconduct or negligence, that's another story. But in the end, you yourself will make some mistakes at a point, so you don't want someone giving you a taste of your own medicine. The last rule, which is actually my favorite one, do not be afraid to disrupt, just know how to do so. There is a paper published in Nature a few months ago, and in that paper, the author used a new metric to see the impact of different research teams on their prospective fields. What they found out that large research teams often advance their, t their field more, but they often do so by using already established popular ideas. On the other hand, smaller teams 
tend to disrupt more. And by disruption, they meant they introduced a new, a new paradigm shift, the new leap that nobody was expecting. And they often do that by using old, unpopular, or forgotten ideas. And that's very reminiscent to what I experienced with my team. So when we started working, we had to review literature as old as the 1950s or the 1930s. We actually found lots of our ideas to have existed in the literature, in little forgotten bits and pieces. And using our model technology, understanding, we were able to formulate them into one big coherent theory. And that, in a way, I feel is a homage to all those scientists and researchers who couldn't finish their work or had their work forgotten. I believe that the ultimate target of multidisciplinary research is to disrupt, is to shake the ground and introduce new ideas. Of course, that sometimes you have to go against the status quo, which is scary, more often than not. So bravery, adventurism, and boldness are very important qualities in science. But they should go hand in hand with humility and pragmatism, so as not to make the fatal mistake of overestimating your, uh, uh, the worth of your ideas or your skills. But indeed, even with all these rules, we had to overcome some problems. <sighs> I like this guy. <laughs> so, especially when we started our research, uh, we had to learn a lot about ourselves and overcome lots of problems. So, for example, we had to learn how people from different research fields think differently and process information differently. Importantly, or more interestingly, I had to learn how theory building in physics is very different from theory building in biology. So in physics, you start the theory top down. You start with the theory or the equation, and then you go down to the observations that supports it. Think the relativity theory. But in biology, we start differently. We start bottom up. We have lots of observation, and then we unify them into one big coherent theory. Think Darwinian theory of evolution. And we had to overcome these kind of thought differences between each other before we were able to work together and be productive and creative. Moreover, we had to learn the limits of each other's skills. More importantly, we had to learn the limits of each other's field, especially when we have to start a new project or have a new idea. And that still takes lots of effort. We have to read and learn about stuff that we were oblivious to. But I think as we grew to know and trust each other, we can navigate this foreign waters in a degree of confidence that wouldn't otherwise exist. In the end, I would like to say that the ultimate rule in science is to have an open mind and an open heart to all ideas coming from people from all walks of life. I consider myself one of those lucky individuals who experience the openness that science offers on a daily basis. That openness that transcends the boundaries of language, religion, or nationality. Science was one of the strongest unifying forces in a world with lots of things that can divide us. And shall we embrace this transcendent nature of science? We ourselves will transcend with our humanity. Thank you very much.